Okay, where we're going now, two degrees Kelvin. Physicists are unlocking a whole new world of cold where the laws of nature appear to break down. You again. Yes. Welcome to my world. What is this place? This is a matter menagerie. You know, like in states of matter? I do know states of matter. Solids, liquids, gases. Now, you've come to like a whole zoo of different states of matter. That is called strange matter. I'd agree with that. We think that it only exists in the centers of neutron stars. This is what I'm particularly proud of. That is the Bose-Einstein condensation. When we discovered that stuff, I won a Nobel Prize. Nice. I like how you work that in. Yeah, well, you know. How many more states of matter are there? The truth is, some people say hundreds. Look at that. It's called a superfluid. Superfluid? Yes. Give it a thing a swirl. What do you think's going to happen? When I stir it? Yeah. It's going to go around and around in the bucket. Uh, give it a shot. Yeah, now a little faster. A superfluid is a state of matter found at temperatures below 2 Kelvin. Oh, weird. Now a little faster yet, yeah. Weird. And once these get started, they'll swirl forever. Oh, That is quantum mechanics in action. As I'm discovering, quantum mechanics is a kind of physics where the usual rules don't apply. You can think of it this way. In the ordinary world, you, me, Adam, anything you want, they act kind of like balls, just like these balls here. They bounce, they roll around, they bash off each other. But in the quantum mechanical world, each of the atoms starts to act more and more like a wave. And eventually, the wave of one atom starts to grow into the wave of the other. And before you know it, when you can't tell one from the other, the atom could be over here or it could be over there. And the cool thing is it could, in some sense, really be both at the same time. Both at the same time? Yeah. I mean, how can something be in two places at once? Um, it's not something we understand that well either. We just go with it. No the mechanics kidding. is like that, yeah. <laughs> And so I, uh, we depart for colder places. To see how this quantum weirdness can be harnessed to solve real world problems. To do that, we'll need to inch closer, a tenth of a degree, a hundredth of a degree above absolute zero. Welcome to one of the coldest places in the universe. <laughs> what? In an office park in a Vancouver suburb? Meet physicist Jordy Rose of D-Wave Systems, who claims they've used cold to build the world's first commercial quantum computer. It's C-3PO's wedding cake. This is a quantum computer. And then what, is, what does that mean? Uh, you have to rethink the way you think about computers to wrap your head around it. Remember that quantum strangeness below 2 Kelvin? Inside this giant refrigerator, Rose's team keeps a few atoms 100 times colder all to harness those weird abilities to make a new kind of computer. So let me get this straight. This entire company, this entire building, this entire meat locker, this entire million dollar apparatus is all designed just to make that tiny chip cold. Yes. What does the cold have to do with the computing? In quantum mechanics, the properties that we're trying to harness are very easily washed out by the movement of the atoms in the processor. As you go down the plates through 4 Kelvin, 0 0.7, 0 0.1, at each stage, we want to remove the wiggling of the atoms so that they just calm down, take a seat on the couch, relax. And when they do that, these wonderful, powerful, magical properties that exist in quantum mechanics blossom out. Quantum properties like being in two places at once. That magical ability allows D-Wave to program their computers in a very special way. The fundamental piece of information storage in this is a device called a qubit. Like the biblical measurements? Like... Very unlike the biblical <laughs> measurement. A qubit is the quantum version of a bit, the basic unit of information. In a regular computer, a bit can be either a zero or a one. But a quantum bit can be either a zero or a one or both zero and one at the same time. This gives it exponentially more power than a conventional computer, which would use eight bits just to store a single number between zero and 256. In a quantum computer, eight qubits can store all 256 numbers at once. 
The real kicker is when you have a lot of these bits, the total number of possibilities doubles every time you add a bit. So, while 10 qubits can store 1,024 numbers, 11 qubits can store 2,048 numbers, when you get to 100 qubits, you can store 1 non million, 267 octillion, 650 septillion, 600 sextillion, 228 quintillion, 229 quartillion, 401 trillion, 496 billion, 73 million, 205,000, and 376 numbers. So by the time you get to about 500 bits, you have more possibilities than there are atoms in the visible universe. Wow. What this means is that a quantum computer can tackle problems on a scale beyond any conventional computer. From weather prediction and air traffic control to forensics and finance. Problems on this scale are everywhere and have simply outstripped our abilities to solve them. And though some have questioned their claims, there are buyers. D-Wave's first customer, aerospace giant Lockheed Martin. Their F-35 fighter plane is incredibly sophisticated. And we have touchdown! Whoa! This is a fairly software-dependent little plane. Yes, it's got uh, about 9 million lines of code. 9 million lines of code? Those 9 million lines of code can land a plane on a carrier, evade enemy radar, and hover like a helicopter. Trouble is, no conventional computer could ever check that software for errors without an army of engineers. Is it just too many variables to all consider at the same That's time? That's exactly right. If you have a million, suddenly you can't manage it with any computer on Earth. Which is why now NASA and Google partner to buy a quantum computer, too, in hopes of better finding habitable planets and speeding up search. Can I have one? How much money you got? <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> so D-Wave's chip is one of the coldest things in the universe? A hundredth of a degree above absolute zero? Well, we're not done yet. I'm about to meet a scientist who can't be bothered with hundredths or even thousandths of a degree for that matter, AKA a millikelvin. We, we are bored by a millikelvin. We like to go to nano-kelvin. That is Nano a, Kelvin? Nano Kelvin. That would be a billionth of a degree. A above billionth of absolute zero. It's very, very cold. It's a million times colder than interstellar space. It's just about the lowest temperature ever reached. A place so clear and cold, physicists can see the fundamental laws of nature in action. MIT's Martin Zvirline is going to use sodium atoms to show me how to get there, the final frontier of cold. Wow. And so how do you do that? So we can uh, start over there at the oven. The oven. Step one, cook up some sodium atoms, the same kind in your table salt, to about 700 degrees Fahrenheit. That way you can separate them. You want to get single atoms to play with, single sodium atoms, lots of them, yep. a whole stream of them. Step two, hit them with lasers. I know you MIT guys have the reputation of being very smart, but I have a little tip for you. Lasers are hot. Ooh. You might be yeah. a little backwards there. Yeah, you might think about Star Trek where they kill people with lasers. Turns out here, we cool atoms down with lasers and they get a recall from it. Just if you hit a billiard ball with another billiard ball. In other words, when you hit atoms with just the right amount of laser light, it acts like a little shove in the opposite direction that the atom is moving, slowing it down. If you look down here, you will actually see the cold cloud right there in the center of the vacuum chamber. So that glowing star thing? It looks, it looks like the sun. It ought to be super, super hot. No, it's actually extremely cold. Those are a billion atoms cooled to a millikelvin. A thousandth of a degree above absolute zero. But lasers can get us only so far. You cannot reach the nano-kelvin temperatures just with laser cooling. So we need another technique. Which brings us to step three. Get out your coffee cup. What takes over after laser cooling is what we call evaporative cooling. It's the same thing that happens to your coffee right now because it's just cooling down. So if you now force it a little bit by blowing on the coffee, uh, you speed that process up. The coffee gets cold more quickly. That's exactly what we do here. But instead of a coffee cup, Zvirline uses a cup made of magnetic fields to trap his atoms. Then he blows on it with radiation and lowers the rim of the cup to let the hotter atoms escape. 
So now we're going to do this coffee cup cooling. It's going to bring us to nano Kelvin. OK. Ready for this? Yes. Let's do this. All right. So can you please switch on this stuff? Do this. This is great. Let's switch on this guy. And then this awesome knob here. Press the awesome white button. Fantastic. <laughs> so that's good. Please press F12. Always button. wondered what F12 does. So you see now the atoms are cooling because the cloud size gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And here you see the temperature drop, 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 drop. Oh, wow. It takes a few minutes, but eventually the atoms become so cold, they lose their individual identities altogether and coalesce into that new state of matter called a Bose-Einstein condensate. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, so yes. that's the condensate? That's the condensate. But look at the temperature. Yeah, it's very cold. 177 <laughs> billionths. Billionths of a degree. 177 billionths of a degree Kelvin. This is the coldest spot in the universe right now. That's right amazing. amazing. So yeah. not even in outer space? No, no, no. Outer space is a million times hotter. Not the dark side of the moon? No, it's like all hot. Comets? Terrible, yeah. Black holes, yeah. Nothing. nothing. This is it, this in, is this, it. in this room. Yes. That's amazing. I, yeah. I would ask its autograph if I could. Yeah. <laughs> But it's not about setting obscure records. What Zverlein is excited about is what these exotic states of matter can teach us about the universe. Our puff of gas teaches us about the neutron stars. Or, a split second after the Big Bang, there was this weird form of matter called a quark gluon plasma. A super hot type of matter in the early universe that would give rise to everything we see today. So you're telling me that this tiny freezing cold dot can teach us something about enormous, blazing hot stuff. That's the fun part of physics. It connects these very different areas. The very hot, very cold, everything is governed by the same laws. Amazingly, what happens at these ultra-cold temperatures is that atoms get so smeared out, their waves start looking indistinguishable from those of super hot particles under extreme pressure. Like those inside the inner core of neutron stars, so dense a teaspoon of them weighs 10 billion tons. Zverlein and others can now simulate substances like this in their labs and probe their mysteries. That's incredible. And then in a couple more years, you'll finally do it. You'll hit 0.0, .0 absolute zero, and we'll be done. Yeah, unfortunately, it's never possible to reach absolute zero. What? You know, there's always going to be a little, little drop of energy sitting around somewhere. Turns out, it's impossible to get to absolute zero, because no matter how cold you get, everything has tiny quantum jitters. And where you have motion, even a tiny amount, you have heat. But that's not stopping scientists from getting even colder to explore the fundamental laws of nature and how our universe came to be. Just the way noise can drown out music, heat is like the noise that obscures things. If you get things really, really cold, you sort of drown out, you damp down all the noise, and you can listen to what nature is whispering to you. It's uncharted territory. Like other frontiers of science, cold has opened the doors to new worlds where the dead may get a second chance. The planet can be cooled by clever innovation. And the universe may be made more understandable. The secrets are all around us as we learn to make stuff colder. On NOVA's website, you can watch this and other episodes of Making Stuff. Find out how the melting of materials like ice and wax can be used to keep our buildings cool. And do you know how super cold materials are helping military ships avoid detection? Take the Making Stuff quiz. Watch original video shorts, explore in-depth reporting, and dive into interactives. Find us at pbs.org nova. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter.